Thank you, Francis, and uh, good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to be here speaking to you all today about this wonderful group of objects found from Llandoisant community in Carmarthenshire. So for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Chris Griffiths and I'm a PhD student with Amged for Cymru, University of Reading, funded by Arts and Humanities Research Council. And yeah, my research is on Middle and Late Bronze Age hordes from South Wales. So first of all, I'd like to give a little bit of background to the hoard, which was discovered in 2020 from Flandois and Community in Carmarthenshire, the boundaries of which are highlighted here. Following this discovery, the hoard was subsequently reported to the local fines liaison officer for Portable Antiquities Scheme in Wales, also known as PAS Cymru, before being handed into the National Museum Cardiff for reporting on as a treasure case. So since beginning my project, I've been fortunate enough to have worked with Adam Gwilt, Principal Curator of Prehistory at Amgate for Cymru, on drafting treasure reports for numerous Bronze Age finds from across Wales are relevant to my research. So following the discovery of the hoard, staff from David Archaeological Trust were commissioned to undertake uh, archaeological investigation of the find spot, which was enabled through grant funding released by CADU. Now, sadly, no evidence survived of the original burial context, but nevertheless, it's probable that the hoard was buried within a discrete and isolated pit in the ground. And more recently, the hoard was officially declared as treasure just last year and has since been acquired by Carmarthenshire Museum, where hoard will hopefully have a rich history of display alongside other objects within their collections. So if we turn now towards the contents of the hoard, based on the types of objects found, a hoard can be comfortably dated to the British Late Bronze Age and specifically to the Ewart Park phase, which eventually spans period 1000 to 800 BC. Now, what is most basic, the hoard consists of 20 objects, uh, 12 socketed axes, two spearheads, two spearhead ferrules, a casting jet, and also two sheet metal fragments and a bracelet fragment. So for those of you with a keen eye, you might notice that the sheet metal and bracelet fragments are not quite visible within this photo, uh, but we'll return to them shortly. So first of all, I want to pick apart the socketed axes and what they can tell us. Six of them are very distinctive of the period, 1000 to 800 BC, and are described as South Wales type axes, or sometimes as Stigursi type axes. Now, South Wales type axes are named so because, simply put, uh, they're mainly found in southeast Wales. Uh, there's two other socketed axes with what's called rib decoration, and you can see these across the top right. And um, both of these types are more common across North and East Wales and Welsh marches. Three plain socketed axes are uh, also included within this group. Uh, two smaller ones are more difficult to identify to a widespread type, but the slender axe on the bottom right is clearly identifiable as a type known as a type Meldrath, and these are generally regarded as a British type. And in Wales, they're relatively common within Ewood Park hordes, but rarely do we find more than a single example within each horde. Now, importantly, the axes were buried in a range of conditions when they were buried together. So half of them are complete or near complete and almost certainly well used prior to their burial. Some of the axes, particularly the two on the far left and that small plain axe on the far right, have asymmetric blade edges, suggesting that they were used, resharpened and reused over time. The slender type Meldrath axe, positioned towards the middle of this group, has a damaged blade, which may have broken during use. Now, perhaps with the exception of the damaged type Meldrath, all the other axes are in pretty good condition. Um, it could have easily been reused. And so permanent burial in the ground again presents us with 
a little bit of a conundrum. Moving on to the second group, we also have these three axes which have been miscast to varying degrees. So when I say that they're miscast, I mean that the bronze failed to fill the moulds completely when the axes were made. Mm, yeah. Small axe on the far left, two holes in the lower body, and there's further casting flaws visible within the socket of the axe itself. It's also clear that this particular axe was never prepared or used. Casting seams are visible down both sides. They're prominent and they got sharp edges, as does the blade and within the gap of the side loop. Now, we might be forgiven for thinking that a miscast object was a failure, uh, but the two other axes on the right-hand side were also miscast, but were apparently good enough in the eyes of the Bronze Age people to be prepared and possibly used. So that middle one um, is highlighted in the box. Again, it's got sort of the mouth you can see is pretty lopsided, um, but it's been prepared and yeah, possibly used. So if we move towards the less complete axes, we have these two examples. Axe on the left may have broken as a result of use, as the walls of the axe are slightly thinner towards the broken side, suggesting a slight casting flaw. Axe fragment on the right, however, has been deliberately fragmented. You'll be able to see the bowing of the metal, uh, but the fragment's been distorted so much that the socket's become enclosed suggesting that the axe was repeatedly struck with blunt-ended tool, even after the axe had been broken. Um, it's deliberate breakage uh, of an object is very common in late Bronze Age hordes. Um, experimental work has shown that it's most likely achieved by heat in the object to a temperature of around 500 to 600 degrees Celsius before being struck with a hammer. Now, the final axe within this hoard is a particularly interesting example um, of a fragmented Southwells type axe, which just so happens to contain the two sheet metal fragments and the bracelet fragment that I mentioned earlier. So highlighted there's the bracelet fragment sticking out. Uh, the damaged cutting edge of the axe suggests that it may have had a history of use before it was broken and the three fragments wedged inside. Uh, to make the containing of the fragments even more secure, the surviving socket was repeatedly hammered so that the broken edges were bent inwards. X-ray image on the right should show the fragments a bit more clearly, uh, but it's hard to know what sheet fragments in particular were, um, what they once belonged to. One of the fragments has a more curvilinear form and a C-shaped section, so it may have once formed part of the rim of a vessel or maybe a hollow bracelet. And now, some of you might be wondering why I'm going into this much detail about condition of the objects, but it's because I want to highlight that these axes, as well as the other objects, which we'll come to shortly, can't be lumped together into a single group. They're not all complete axes, hidden perhaps for safekeeping, waiting to be redistributed, or scrap waiting to be recycled. They had a multitude of lives and complex histories before they were brought together and buried in the ground. So, in addition to the axes, we also have two spearheads, one of which is shown here. A spearheads of this form relatively common throughout the late Bronze Age. There's around 20 other hordes of Edward Park date from Wales, which contain spearheads of a similar form. Once again, we can see the spearhead being struck with a blunt tool in antiquity. Uh, one of these impact marks can be more clearly seen with the bottom of an image, uh, which is a top-down view of the lower socket end fragment. Now, interestingly, these two fragments are found at the top of the hoard and lying on top of each other, indicating that they were the last objects to be buried. So we can perhaps imagine that the snapping of the spearhead and burial of the two pieces was perhaps linked to a sort of performance surrounding the burial of the objects. Deliberate breaking of a potent hunting tool and weapon presumably would have been quite a dramatic event for anyone looking on. 
A second spearhead within this hoard is represented by a small blade fragment, which probably once belonged to a spearhead with a hollow blade, such as this illustrated example from the Gillsfield hoard, Montgomeryshire. This particular fragment probably represents the lower blade of such a spear, and we can only presume that the rest was melted down and recycled, or perhaps buried elsewhere. Again, shows here clear signs, deliberate fragmentation, and having been repeatedly struck with a blunt-ended tool, resulting in a crushed appearance. Now, interesting, also included with this slender St. Hoard were two spear ferrule fragments. When complete, these would have capped the bottom of the wooden spear shaft, such as that shown on the image on the right. Um, one of the ferrules has suffered some more recent damage, um, probably when it was recovered um, recently, but they were both deliberately broken prior to the burial and have once again been crushed. Uh, ferrules are relatively rare finds from Wales. Uh, previously mentioned hoard from Gillsfield um, contains numerous examples, but it slightly predates the Flandois and Hoard. Now, additionally, five ferrules were also found within the Pantomine Hoard from Pembrokeshire, which is a weapon dominant deposit discovered around 1859 during peat cutting. And this is contemporary with the Flandois and Hoard, as well as containing several sword fragments, which derive from at least three individual swords. Pantomine hoard contains numerous spearheads. And finally, last object that we have in this hoard is a casting jet, which would have formed at the top of a two-piece mould when the molten bronze was poured into object-shaped void below it. The image on the right gives you an impression of this process, um, but presence of a single runner stub there, sort of highlighted in the circle, suggests that this jet formed during the casting of a weapon or a tool instead of an axe, where we'd expect there to be more of runner stubs. Though perhaps not the most exciting object to look at within this hoard, uh, the presence of a casting jet is pretty important as it suggests that perhaps a bronze metal worker was operating within the area and was at least partly involved in bringing together these objects for deposition. So I'm gonna take a bit of a step back from Flandois and Horde now and talk a little more generally about what else is happening around this time, specifically in relation to hoarding and deposition. So using data from the past 25 years of hoard discoveries from the UK, can get a good overall impression of what was going on in terms of hoarding. So during the early Bronze Age, which is um, from about 2200 to 1550 BC, there's generally low numbers of hoards, uh, which contain relatively few objects. Now, a noticeable increase in the number of hoards and objects deposited within them is visible in the Taunton phase of the Middle Bronze Age spans period 1400 to 1275 BC, before we see a drop in the Pinard phase, which follows it, and that continues up to about 1150 BC. Now, relatively low numbers of hordes are maintained into the beginning of the Late Bronze Age, but it's during the Ewood Park phase, which is when Flandois and Horde dates to, um, that we see vast quantities of hordes um, and metalwork being buried. And this fits into a much broader Northwest and European tradition of bearing objects, mainly metalwork within the ground. So we can begin to tease out some further details. So these two maps uh, depict the same data shown in the previous slide. But this time I'd like to draw your attention to changes in the distribution and density of middle and late Bronze Age hordes. So the map on the left gives you an idea of the distribution of Middle Bronze Age hordes, which are overwhelmingly concentrated in Southern England, relatively rare elsewhere. But by comparison, Late Bronze Age hordes, they're far more numerous, widespread in general distribution, but with concentrations over parts of Eastern and Southeastern England, and more importantly, in this case, Southeast Wales. 
So pre-highlight position of the Slandoisant horde, as seen on the right-hand side, you can see that it occupies a little bit of a peripheral space. A vast majority of late Bronze Age hordes from southeast Wales have been found in the Vale of Glamorgan and Monmouthshire. So we can gain further insight into this position that Llandoes and Horde occupies by considering what the presence of South Wales type axes can tell us. So um, just to remind you what they look like, there's that one on the left. So the data that this map's based on is still work in progress, but it depicts the distribution of every South Wales type axe known from Southern Britain. As you'll be able to see, Axes are overwhelmingly concentrated across parts of southeast Wales in both hordes and the single finds. Now, across the Bristol Channel, you see that there's one horde which contains a significant number of South Wales type axes, which is the Wick Park Stigurzi horde, uh, which is why some, some people call these axes Stigurzi types. Now, more recently, it's been argued by Matt Knight, um, who did his PhD, sort of covering Bronze Age metalwork from Southwest England, specifically deliberate destruction. Um, and he argued that this horde actually represents an intrusion from South Wales. Um, the horde sort of stands out as quite alien when compared to the rest of Somerset in particular. Spread of single finds across southern England significant also, but uh, I digress, that's a topic for another day. If we focus our attention back to South Wales, Sandoys and Hordes marked by a little red star, sorry, arrow, um, and doesn't quite seem so isolated as before. Uh, just to the northwest is the Mudfoy Horde, and to the southeast, uh, the Penquist Horde, both of which contain six South Wales type axes, the same quantity as the Flandoysen Todd. Coincidence? Maybe. Um, more work needs to be done in characterising the content of these two other hordes, but nevertheless this small group of hordes from the Uplands appears to be quite interesting. So if we kind of bring everything together, a uh, horde from Flandoysen community occupies maybe a bit of a periphery space between West and Southeast Wales. Strong presence of South Wales type axes indicates influence from communities in Southeast Wales. The presence of this horde outside of the main concentration of these axes may have been significant also. Presence of spear ferals, perhaps suggestive of influence from communities further West where we see hordes like pantomime being deposited. So just to conclude, um, let's come back to this image um, I showed earlier, just to highlight how many hordes have been discovered over the past couple of decades. A lot more work remains to be done further characterizing not just the late Bronze Age hordes, but also middle Bronze Age hordes from across South Wales. The past 25 years of metal detecting and treasure have had an enormous impact on the number of late Bronze Age hordes reported from across Britain, especially southeast and west Wales, regions which have been poorly represented in recent literature. So hopefully you'll all agree that shining spotlight on this wonderful group of objects has allowed for a richer story of objects and people in the Bronze Age to be told. And uh, yeah, watch, watch this space. So, Thank you all very much for listening.